Thank you very much, Alexandra. And you can hear from both of them the English that they've, they've been studying abroad as a part of their PhD studies. So, um, so we are very proud of you, colleagues. So, uh, I will hand the responsibility over to my colleague, Professor Per Vanni, for the rest of the seminar. Thank you, Anish. Uh, thank you, Kuma, uh, for the kind introductory words. I'm Per Vanvik. I'm uh, one of the founders and the CEO of the Magic Evidence Ecosystem Foundation. I also have a part-time position as a consultant position here at this hospital and a couple of other positions. Uh, but most importantly, um, we are here to celebrate, I think, our partnership between Magic and Louise Mag. And now we heard about a few examples of research, excellent research at this hospital. And the question is really, how could this evidence, this new research, have an impact on patient care? And that's really our, our, our joint goal, uh, is to see how we could work more closely together, both at the local level, but also at the international level, to enhance what we call an evidence ecosystem. And I will be very brief. Uh, I would love to talk more about the journey from when I discovered evidence-based medicine in a bookstore in 2003, I uh, hooked up with people in Norway to study this and then went to Canada with my family uh, as a postdoc um, and then creating or giving birth to magic at Jövik Hospital in Lana, uh, staying there for years, thanks to so many colleagues. Uh, we have now ended up here. And uh, I will then just introduce the next uh, part of the program and take you through uh, what we call magic in this uh, evidence ecosystem, why bother? Uh, we'll hear from Thomas Agritzas and then uh, Stein van der Velde, who's helping us with the technical support. They will present our work. Uh, Lynn Brandt, who's the mastermind behind the Magic App platform, you'll hear more about. She's uh, home uh, following from Zoom, giving a flu. Uh, but we will keep this in 30 minutes or a bit shorter now uh, before you'll have a coffee break. Then we'll move to a very exciting topic. We have colleagues from WHO here in the audience. We have NICE um, and uh, Australia and the BMJ giving presentations about this breakthrough for living evidence and guidance in the pandemic. And then we'll have, in the end, we've modified the program a bit, a plenary discussion where you all could ask questions. So please, please save them on Zoom, please chat. Uh, and we'll discuss the implications of what you heard today. And most importantly, you're all heartily welcome to join us at Villa Viten for some uh, sparkling drinks and some finger food and mingling after the uh, seminar ends at 3 p.m. Great to see you here and uh, even more people on Zoom uh, from all parts of the world, actually. And uh, now over to Thomas, my dear colleague, co-founder uh, and uh, deputy CEO in Magic. He will start this uh, journey. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Pe. Thank you, everyone. It is a great pleasure to uh, be coming from Switzerland. I'm based in Geneva, actually, um, working as a, an internist at the University Hospitals of Geneva. So it's a great pleasure to travel finally professionally after this uh, beginning of the pandemic. And I take it with us that we should also introduce this presentation in Switzerland, starting with music. We don't do that, but I find this a great, uh, a great idea. So it's my pleasure to uh, present to you what we do in Magic. We should focus on Zoom as well, um, and how we uh, hope to enhance the digital and trustworthy evidence ecosystem. I have no financial conflict of interest with the presentation here. It's important what we do in Magic has to stay out of any um, conflict of interest financial. But I have strong intellectual investment, like Per and the others, in everything we do. Uh, listed here, the great working group, MAGIC, the BMJ, Rapid Rex, et cetera. So of course, I will be uh, a little promotional in our work, um, but feel free to, um, to evaluate it on your own terms. Uh, we are in a pandemic, of course, so I've chosen a, a, a case of COVID, but we speak of other things as well. Think of John, this imaginary patient engineer hospitalized, who is reading the media like all of all, us all and is realizing that he would maybe need a cocktail of antibodies because uh, his COVID case is getting more severe. And he's asking about that. He's also interested in what happens in the States, a little less now, but it was very um, influential. Horse-based that people ate, ivermectin, um, 
So he's, uh, he's asking a lot of questions and he's very aware of things happening. Is good? I'm not trying to get that way. Ah, I'm not sure why it is podcast. If you stop there, no. Mm -hmm. Any good advice from the room? Yeah, sorry. Down it down is better. Yeah. Technology, huh? And I can also do that. Is that better? Okay. Sean is asking questions about monoclonal antibodies and ivermectin. So, you know, clinicians and their patients need guidance. It needs to be trustworthy. It's going to be a fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let's give up. I'll put it on the top. I'll put it on the top. It's easier. Gosh. Um, clinicians need, need and patients need uh, guidelines. They need it to be trustworthy, timely, up-to-date, accessible, understandable. And so organizations producing these guidelines need to have the best current standards, the methods to do so, processes and platforms. So how can all of these people working in that field um, help Don and his uh, doctor get the right information? How can this evidence ecosystem provide the right advice and the right uh, timing? To understand that we need to go a bit past in time. So I invite you in the pre-COVID area, um, two decades ago, <laughs> when uh, all the principles of EBM started Pervandic mentioned Canada, where some of us went to train with the leaders of EVM, Gordon Guyatt, in particular, who is part of our magic team. And this has changed medicine, as we know. This has structured the knowledge and how we appraise it. But this has continued to evolve, you know, with the great methodology that many of you know. The WHO is applying in their guidelines, like many other partners. So a very structured way of uh, using and appraising the evidence is really the ground uh, work that was needed in order to have a better evidence ecosystem. However, we know many problems remained, particularly with clinical practice guidelines. Lots of publications, this one is very famous, on failure to meet the standards for trustworthiness. Um, lots of distrust. I spoke of conflict of interest, which is an ongoing problem, not just financial, but intellectual as well. And we saw all the uh, power of opinions in the pandemic and how it can influence uh, what we are supposed to do. And a more profound criticism, which is guidelines, is from the past. We shouldn't focus on guidelines. We're in a post-guideline era where it's all about the interaction with the patients, shared decision-making, of course, with the danger of removing any sort of guidance and maybe be dealing with a very large information overload. So this problem has massively remained. A decade ago, there were standards for trustworthiness for guidelines by the um, Institute of Medicine. They are listed here. They make a lot of sense. You know, it's basically transparency about the question, the sources of the evidence, how we appraise it, who is involved in the process, that they have no conflict of interest, that patients have participated. If you really read them one by one, there is no criteria that is insanely crazy. It makes sense for a guideline to apply those trustworthiness criteria. But, and the study of Kuhn et al was very famous a decade ago, it remains true. More than half of the guidelines meet only half of the trustworthiness criteria. And in certain specialties, it's even worse. So we made progress in EBM, we made progress in methods. We know we need guidance with the massive information overload that is out there, but we sometimes fail to make progress in the methodology of the guideline itself, not to mention the massive uh, conflict of interest uh, leading it. We have an ecosystem. An ecosystem means that the partners are already in place. All of these stakeholders working in the evidence in the background in the clinical field. So it's not like we have to make something new. The evidence ecosystem exists, but there is those silos that you mentioned as well in your introductory presentation. And we, we try to work from one silo to the other, uh, but probably not very effectively. And this is where um, we in MAGIC hope to help. Um, the MAGIC evidence ecosystem, as we chose to call it, uh, foundation, has this goal of helping bridge those silos and meet the trustworthiness criteria for evidence appraisal and clinical practice guidelines. So we are a very large team. Our board here are four members, Per Van Vick, Lynn Brandt, Gordon Guyatt that I mentioned, and myself, but many others, uh, Stein van der Velde, Anja uh, Fokin, who is in the room as well. 
participated in the last decade in, in development of our projects and collaboration. And here is our vision, you know, very um, uh, summarized of what the ecosystem might be. The patient is at the center. Everything we do in the ecosystem is to improve the care of patients. But you have evidence producers, people who do trials, observational studies, like the studies we've seen, you know, on each topic and, uh, and condition. Evidence synthesizers, systematic reviewers, meta-analysts, statisticians who try to get a little higher in the body of evidence and gather all the evidence on a given questions. But this is not enough, then it moves to guideline makers, people who try to provide guidance, institutions, WHO, uh, national authorities, et cetera, uh, who, whose aim is to disseminate processed knowledge, knowledge that can be actually applied in practice in the form of guidelines to clinicians, but also tools for patients, shared decision-making, things that can support the conversation. So evidence disseminators to patients. We have the brave ones at the bottom, probably the more brave of them all, the evidence implementers, the people who try to improve the quality of care, all the front field uh, clinicians, physicians, nurses who try to bring that evidence in the field. And it's a loop, right? Because everybody knows the knowledge gap. We hope the uh, research priorities are matched with what we see in practice. Not always the case, but we try. And this goes on and on. And we believe that's what the ecosystem is uh, with many other partners that are men not mentioned here, but health policy makers, system level um, actors in the field that influence that evidence ecosystem. Behind it, in the background, we believe that there's a strong need of ingredients to improve, you know, to make this evidence ecosystem flow better. Uh, we need development of sound methods, and I alluded to them in terms of methodology. We need coordination and support. Those methods are complex. Um, the job of methodologists now has become, you know, a specialty in itself in supporting groups to apply those, um, these methodologies in practice. We need tools and platforms in 2021, not just PDF and Word documents on how to produce guidelines, but how to digitally structure everything. And this is in the middle of this evidence ecosystem. Magic is trying to digitally structure all the ingredients of evidence, appraisal, and, and guidelines. You need to involve, to partner with patients throughout the process, not just at the beginning and very end, but throughout all, all, each of these steps. Train everyone uh, so that they become independent and can do uh, then the work uh, on their own. And you need to share a culture of innovation um, and sharing and data sharing uh, that is important. So of course you could put anything that you value most at the middle of this evidence ecosystem. This is just a snapshot of what we think in, ma in magic is central uh, to make things happen. And one of the deliverables we've created in our non-for-profit foundation is the Magic App, which is an authoring and publication platform. And bear with me, I won't be too technical, but just show you a bit of what Magic can do. It's now widely used by uh, thousands of users, more than 60 active organizations, many others that have tried it or did some guidelines, but 60 prominent active organizations creating guidelines with Magic and more than 140 public guidelines uh, disseminated through the platform. And this is a um, summary of what magic can do. So I'll just walk you through. In the middle, there is a technical part that uh, should have been presented by Lynn Brandt, really the mastermind of magic app, uh, a database of structured and tag content from the PICO, the, the question itself, the evidence summary, the effect estimates, the judgments about the quality of the evidence and certainty, the rationale that guideline panels have for any given question is digitally structured at the core of the Magic App. You can get in the Magic App, you can import stuff from other partners in the evidence ecosystem, Revman, Cochrane, Covidence, PubMed, EndNote. So we really value a lot the fact that tools can talk to each other so you can import things in, that you can export things out. Of course, you still need PDF and Word documents, but also what we call widgets. So it's the um, technical innovation that allows you to take content from Magic and put it wherever you like on a um, web platform of your own, on your hospital platform. You can bring evidence summary, bits of recommendations, elements of rationale. So you don't have to be stuck within the way we present the tool, but you can use the data in the tool in other ways, like we have done with uh, the British Medical Journal and the rapid recommendation, and I'll show you that. Within Magic, we've innovated to create presentation formats. 
because when you have all these ingredients, you can start and play and test what formats work better for practice, how clinicians and patients understand the evidence better. So those formats are implemented in MatchIt, interactive multi-layered. You can integrate it in electronic health record. This is really a next step and Stein van der Velde uh, will probably talk about it and Lynn Brandt is conducting research on that field as well how you can bring the recommendation, the evidence summary within our own practice in the electronic health record. You can adapt guidelines, which is very interesting. We were discussing with WHO this morning, how when you produce a guideline with those platforms, you can then hopefully share the data and adapt the elements that are different in a given country, in a given context, but still have use of everything else that may be the same or not change. And you can develop, this is one of my favorite parts of magic, decision aids, so uh, formats of the same ingredients that help you discuss with patients at the point of care uh, and improve their decision-making. This is very dynamic because like when you do digital work, any change you make is saved and traceable and, and any new change will impact the rest of the guideline inside. So it opens the doors to what we call living evidence and living guidelines um, to not be a static, guideline or static evidence summary, but something that moves. So this is really an, uh, an overview, and it might be too much, but of what MAGIC currently offers um, in the field. I mentioned the decision-making. Here's an example of the research we did to translate guideline elements in tools for shared decision-making and not say it's either guidelines or shared decision-making. It's actually both. Clinicians need the guidance. We have stronger recommendations, but also conditional and weak recommendations. And all of these elements can be used to discuss and make real life decisions that may agree or not agree with a given recommendation. We do a lot of user testing. So the formats we do, we test, and it's been done a lot in Norway here um, in real decision making with real clinicians, real patients. And we develop formats that can be used on uh, platforms, um, iPads, et cetera. Um, this is a very interesting field of research as well, is to identify gaps in the way we structure the evidence. Uh, what we found, and um, it was a PhD work from Anya Fokhin, who um, um, found that practical issues, the summary of what patients share as practical issues in day life, was not systematically summarized in evidence summary. So we did create a structure in Magic App, we mapped out patient experience from large databases. And you could see here dimensions of food, exercise, social life, coordination of care that we know patients talk about and that are ingredients for shared decision making. And so this is not just theoretical, but once you do the work, you structure the data in Magic App to invite people in the evidence ecosystem to summarize it, to bring that to their attention. And once they do, to use that in decision aids and in tools for dissemination. So this is a very fascinating piece of work that we, we also did in the last decade. And then MAGIC helps you, um, you know, we spoke of training and method support, it guides you through the guideline methods process. You have to define your PICO, your question, your outcomes, critical, less critical, to summarize the study, to create evidence summaries, to move from evidence to recommendation using standard frameworks, that go beyond just the benefits and harms, but also include feasibility, accessibility, equity issues that can be again digitally structured in the guideline and to formulate recommendation with a good strength uh, of, um, of recommendation and associated quality of evidence. So the tool is designed to help you train in doing that and do that for your own guidelines. Um, I won't dive into too many technical issues, but it's also didactic because when you have to enter the data, you realize that, oh, I need the relative effect estimates. I need the systematic review of high quality summarizing the effect of an intervention. I also need to think of what's the baseline risk uh, of a given outcome, mortality, COVID mortality, for example, in a given region or hospital, because whatever that baseline is, I'm able to modify with the evidence summaries upfront. And the tool that helps you uh, compute absolute effects and judge the certainty accordingly. And we create those evidence summaries. Some of them are quite complex, like this one, quite comprehensive, according to grade methodology, where for each outcome, you have the effect estimates, the certainty, and lay language summary. 
So this is a lot of things, right? And then you, you say, how can we go further in the evidence ecosystem to improve that at a deeper level, particularly on those three elements, evidence synthesis, evidence dissemination to clinicians, guidelines, and dissemination to patients. So we created the, um, uh, the project, uh, the rapid recommendation, rapid Rex, in partnership with the British Medical Journal, which shows a journal that shared our views. Um, and we're very fortunate to meet Fiona Godley, who's gonna be here, Helen McDonald and others uh, who really co-created that project with us. It didn't just publish what we did, but we co-created uh, this project of dissemination. And I'm going to share a few examples of rapid Rex um, as guidelines used in magic. Here is the process we use in rapid Rex is a um, evidence monitoring through McMaster. We choose a topic that we prioritize together, practice changing, and we aim for the rapid Rex to do that in 45 days or so to uh, have a meta-analysis, one, two, or three meta-analysis on a topic, and in 90 days, recommendations that are disseminated in the BMJ with all the magic formats I've displayed to you. Uh, we worked quite a lot over the last five years. We did, uh, I counted yesterday, 20 guidelines, including 45 recommendations, and those were informed by 28 systematic reviews, and now two uh, living systematic reviews, uh, soon three, that we did in partnership with WHO. And we try to cover many different topics to make a proof of concept that those methodologies and tools can be applied in different fields. So for example, in screening, prostate cancer, colorectal screening, in primary care, um, medication, for example, we just produced one on medical cannabis for chronic pain, for example, um, but also anti-diabetics, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, for uh, adults with type two diabetes. We have uh, drugs in acute care, hospital care, and here we have our prominent uh, rapid rec. You notice is a living WHO guideline on COVID-19. So WHO was interested in um, um, using some of our approaches and improving their guidelines, and we were fortunate to, to be working with them, and they, they'll say more soon on this collaboration. Um, we also chose topics that are choosing wisely, if you like, so uh, less is more approach, recommendations, for current practice that do not work. So strong recommendation to stop using them with the same approach. And uh, we'll allude to the subacromial decompression surgery, for example, shoulder surgery for shoulder pain or arthroscopy. And we also summarize evidence for devices uh, like TAVI for surgical um, uh, versus a surgical aortic valve replacement therapy. So the idea here was not to cover the whole of medicine, but to prove that you can apply those methods across the board we don't have anything on autism, but maybe soon we'll have a rapid rec on autism, I hope. Um, so I'll just use a few examples, the one on diabetes, the one on WHO, and Stein will then show one on, sh on shoulder um, surgery um, to, to help you see what we mean by this work. Here is the diabetes one. And here's another innovation is to say, now we have all the ingredients in Magic App, can we also work on infographics. So this is a partnership with the BMJ, visuals that help you understand mapping better the evidence. Here's the population, a very complex population of adults with few risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors, more than three, an actual cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, or a combination of both. And you can see how we've mapped out here four or five recommendations according to these um, different populations. And we were particularly interested in this rapid rec on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. I show this example because this is one of the largest evidence summaries I've ever seen. Um, it's tens of thousands of articles screened, but 764 randomized trials combined together. I've never seen that. I think it's a, one of the largest summaries, so it's quite crazy. You see here the network of all trials comparing different drugs one with each other. And this shows you another challenge is this information overload, not just with COVID, but with everything else. So many studies that you could read them one by one, even meta-analyzing them is difficult. So can we deal with that information overload? And we believe we have, the, the, the panel has in using that methodology. And here you have the infographic of the, um, the LGLT2 on the left and GLP-1 agonist on the right. And with the strength of recommendation, for each of the risk strata, each of the different groups, weak against, then weak in favor, then sometimes strong in favor for the patients who have combined risk factors. So this gives you an immediate visual of the recommendation. You can dive at each level 
and have the evidence summaries uh, for each level. I spoke of tools for shared decision-making or interactive tools. We mentioned ShareIt, the decision aids we developed. Now we moved from ShareIt to MatchIt, um, and we have several PhD students working on the field with us to test those multi, multiple comparison tools like this one. It allows you to move outcomes in and out, move interventions in and out, and browse the effect of each intervention that you want to focus on or discuss with your patient. You have the usual uh, visuals and infographics, but you also have ways to, again, deal with information overload with testing, color coding. Uh, this is really research now I'm showing to you on how you can find the winners, the, the drugs that are uh, more likely to work and help, and the losers, the one you shouldn't use for a given uh, population, and, um, and help you just uh, digest th this massive information. And MAGIC, uh, with many other partners, is really pushing for that collaboration in the ecosystem. If you think of those drugs, they um, are not just um, the work of cardiologists or diabetologists, but also nephrologists, inter internists, primary care physicians. So you need to have all those people working together and not just a given specialty. If I come back to John, I you know, steal some COVID in the, in the air. Uh, John has still his questions about the treatment. We did partner um, with offer our services to WHO, uh, more to say, to help them with their guidelines. And we helped our large team help with three living systematic reviews, one on therapy, one on prophylaxis, and one on blood-related products, including monoclonal antibodies. And these are informing the WHO guidelines on therapeutics, uh, which are living guidelines, drug to prevent COVID-19, and the main uh, clinical management guideline from WHO. And in doing so, we have again here the example of the main systematic review. Again, one of the largest uh, we've seen with uh, tens of thousands of articles and databases summarized. Almost 2,000 randomized trials now included on the drugs on COVID. And you see, it's, it's too small, but just to give you again a way to deal with the information overload, 20 interventions, 10 outcomes, 11 outcomes, and how you can map them out and identify that, yes, corticosteroids have some green in the summary, so they have the largest effect with the largest certainty, and many other drugs that you would consider just simply don't work or have too much uncertainty attached to it. We developed new types of infographics with the BMJ, how to compare that very complex network. Here is the network of all interventions in the circle, just comparing mortality. And if you look at all the evidence on mortality, including low certainty, you see one of the most beautiful networks comparing everything with everything and you see why discussions on COVID can be so passionate. <laughs> and, uh, and the WHO guideline is also published in the BMJ again with those infographics and you see how visually you can see the recommendation, the treatments not recommended, ivermectin is not, um, sadly for some and, and hydroxychloroquine, but we do have the steroids, we do have the anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibodies. And as WHO is leading the continuous living guidance, new drugs that will appear, new decisions to make. Do we combine everything? Do we choose one or the other? You can see the challenges in uh, moving in this moving target. Here, the summary of the monoclonal antibody has this other way of using the same information I've shown you, a quick infographic on main outcomes, no difference on certain difference from others and help you understand uh, why the recommendation made by the panel is the one shown here. I'll stop here and I'll move to Stein. Um, this just a brief overview. I hope it was not too much on what magic can do. But the next step, I, I said, it, are the brave ones, the ones who are actually using this to change practice. So the evidence implementers, and uh, Stein will tell you about one of our um, large project, the E3 project that hopes to help in that field. Thank you very much. As you have understood, we need to delay the break a bit. Sorry about that. It was a lot to present. Thank you, Thomas. And then you will finish by 3.30. 10 more minutes I need. Then we can have a break. Let me introduce you to my wife. She's a passionate paddle guide in her free time, but she's suffering from shoulder impingement. So last year, she decided to start an exercise program with a physiotherapist. And in only a couple of weeks, she experienced satisfactory relief. Chances are low today in Norway that you would get surgery for this type of problem. But this has been 
a common procedure over a period of 20, 30 years. So if we look closer at the evolution over time, we can see in the 1990s, this technique started to become more and more popular. Until in 2007, Finnish clinicians found out that this technique was less effective than thought. A couple of years afterwards, we can see that in countries like Norway and England, they observed the same thing and the technique started to be de-implemented. So what happened in these 30 years? Well, initially there were a couple of trials, smaller trials, higher risk of bias, showing no effect, but nobody really cared. It was not until the start of a large trial, 2005 in Finland, that people observed that people observed that this is not the way to go. 2012, also the UK started a larger trial and you can see the same effect after one year, data are being analyzed, people talk on conferences. Okay, the message comes across. Today in Norway, you can see the numbers here, they have gone down. The most precise uh, data show that we are at- Oh yeah. Okay, I'll try to mute. Um, yeah, I'll just continue. So in 2018, the findings from those two trials were published and that was the trigger then to also make a BMJ rapid recommendation on the topic being published in February, 2019. So a strong recommendation to stop with arthroscopic surgery for shoulder impingement and a strong recommendation for physiotherapy or non-operative management only. So, okay, shoulder atroscopy is on its way out. That's good, but did we really need 30 years to learn? Can't we do this faster? And this is exactly the ambition of the E3 project, also called the Enhanced Evidence Ecosystem. Our ambition is to turn this slow and cumbersome process into a streamlined collaboration across partners in the ecosystem. And this needs bridges that we need to build. And the essential starting point is conversations with people like we are having today. So in the presentation now, I want to discuss with you how we are designing ecosystems how we are trying to build those bridges while we are walking on them and which methods we are exploring to demonstrate, to evaluate if we are practice changing. All these parts involve research and our brand new magician, Siri Seterelf, will focus on that as part of her PhD. So this will take us three years. Um, we will have a focus mostly on Norway but we are also discussing with other countries that are having an interest in following the same research methods. So the first step, how are we designing this ecosystem? Well, we need a map. We need a map to understand how the current ecosystem is organized in Norway. And therefore we're having interviews with key persons from different sectors in the evidence ecosystem. We will ask them general questions and we will present them existing BMJ rapid recommendations to understand how they impacted care in Norway. Did they come in time? Were they used? Were they noticed? Were any implementation activities related to that? I think we can learn from those interviews. So that will give us an understanding of where we are now, but then how to come to an enhanced ecosystem. Well, I hope the interviews will give us new insights. But in addition to that, we also want to visit implementation leaders abroad to learn from them, how are they organized? And then to come up with suggestions for an enhanced ecosystem. We will work through three cases, either existing BMJ rapid recs or recommendations that we will develop from now on. And then we will go through this process from the guidance being disseminated internationally, then coming to Norway. There we need an adaptation process. We need an implementation strategy and we need a strategy to evaluate 
if this is changing practice or not. So to pick our cases, we think it's important to look how recommendations differ. And Thomas, you already mentioned um, this. We, we have different categories. We have either strong recommendations where we think this is appropriate for every patient or nearly all patients. We also have weak recommendations or conditional recommendations, and those require shared decision-making. And also within the E3 project, we relate to the Match It project. Um, so we will also focus on this case. And then what about recommendations against the implementation? Also those require a different approach. So we will have those um, on one side, but then we will also explore different methods to evaluate change in practice. We will try to use data available through the electronic medical records to see what is the baseline and what happens from month to month throughout the implementation strategy. The same for registry data available in Norway. How can we use that as guideline developers? For us, there is kind of uh, a way forward to discover. We want to um, find out what would be the easiest way for us to make efficient use of that. And then of course, there are different quality improvement processes. Also those, we will use them in one of the cases or in um, more of them. So computerized decision support will be the implementation strategy the, of first choice. We will open up to other strategies when needed, but we have a primary interest in computerized decision support. And our partner DIPS is supporting us in getting magic recommendations into the electronic medical record, as for example, being used here at Lovisenberg Diakonale Hospital. So you can see here, for example, this is a, a demo um, for a patient, Dreivang Kair Anne, I think. Uh, she is suffering from diabetes type two. We can also see that she is having a kidney disease. DIPS is helping us through smart methods to either use structured data available in the electronic medical record or information that is available narratively, um, quick notes in through the electronic record to make the connection with recommendations available in MagicCap and to show them in the heart of the workflow in the electronic medical records. While the patient is there, the physician can then make choices to uh, how to um, organize treatment. So evolving from ego systems to ecosystems is what is hidden behind this Zoom uh, tab. Well, we are grateful for this rich and growing pool of partners, both Norwegian partners and international partners. Um, We're grateful for the funding that we have from Helse Sørøst for this three-year project. I think all here can agree that it is University Hospital in Northern Norway that has the coolest logo. Um, and we, um, yeah, we have a standing invitation. We want more partners. We might not know you right now, but this is an invitation. If you feel our logo should be part of that screen, um, or we are having a really interesting case for you, or we're having a piece of the puzzle that can help you move through this ecosystem, well, then just drop us an email at tain.magicevidence.org and we start the conversation with you, making this a co-create process. Or maybe you liked the initial ID best to have a paddle trip together with my wife. If so, I will not be mad. Send me an email and we can fix that as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas and Stein. Again, apologies for not keeping the time. We were a bit uh, stretched. So I suggest now we take a break for 11 minutes. At least those who need to uh, go out for, for those minutes can do. And we'll meet back at uh, 240. And that's important that we are back at that time because Fee Godley, the editor-in-chief in BMJ, will start. And she has another meeting at 3 p.m.
So she's waiting and I just told her that I hope she can wait 10 minutes to start. Okay, thank you all and uh, see you back in now 10 minutes. Yeah, we had some technical mysteries. Have floating meeting control. Yeah, that's the good one. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, and then it was more, more hide. That was the one. Okay, good. Perfect. Okay, so Fiona is not having slides, but she. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hi, Fiona. Yes. Hello. Great to see you. Hi. Is that good enough? The sound. Yeah, it's sound is perfect. Sound. Perfect. It's all good. Thank you so much for being with us. No, I'm so sorry I can't be with you with you more. But anyway, I'm delighted to to be doing. I mean, I'll just be talking, and and um, I hope that's all right. <laughs> perfect. We, we also like that. Yeah, that's right. I want to come on the canoe though. I want to go paddleboarding with your wife. <laughs> I let her know. <laughs> Okay, so we'll use the screen then, I think. Yeah, we can all see you up there. Gosh, I'm having to dodge, dodge the sunlight in this room. You here. Um, and also a final really important shout out to Will Stahl Timmons, who has produced these fantastic infographics and that, that in itself is an enormous innovation. So um, the credit must go to, to those people and, and others who, who've also helped on the BMJ team. I just thought I'd reflect back about um, where we have, where, how we got to, to this. The guidelines, clinical guidelines have, have been around for some time, obviously, but I'm uh, old enough to remember textbooks um, and how we used to all learn our medicine from textbooks. We knew at the time that they were 10 years out of date, um, but we still uh, had them and loved them and, and um, passed our exams on the basis of them. Um, uh, then we had CDs, if you remember those, which were very, a very huge innovation um, where you could actually capture um, th th this slightly more updated information. But it was always very selective. The risk was that it was selective. And, and Cochrane was coming forward in that time to try to be much more systematic in this. So Cochrane Systematic was used from the early 90s onwards, um, out of which we at the BMJ built a product called Clinical Evidence, which was intended to help clinicians and patients make, make informed decisions and to let them know what what was um, where there was evidence and where there wasn't and nice guidelines of course very very important internationally and in the UK um, as as a as a next step in the very best quality of guidelines but all clinical guidelines struggled struggled to keep up to date and struggled to add new evidence 
um, and and you know having good processes meant that there were delays um, and and those things seemed inevitable. Uh, so this initiative that Magic has brought to us is immensely important, um, and um, the learning that has gone on in the process of, of developing the, um, the Magic app and the rapid recommendations and the living systematic reviews has really been immense, and, and we we owe we owe everyone involved an enormous debt of gratitude. And I, I think it will only only go um, to greater and better things. Just to articulate some of the achievements, um, both in the guideline itself and in the evidence uh, synthesis. Um, the guideline, I think, one of the things the things that have impressed me is the as the processes behind them, which have taken a step forward in in a number of fronts. One is obviously how the, how the evidence has been evaluated. Another is the strict conflict of interest policies that have been applied to these guidelines uh, in the creation of the guidelines from the evidence. Um, and I think that's something certainly the BMJ has been very keen to promote for, for many, many years um, and, and trying to really understand how we deal with conflict of interest, who can and can't be involved in decision making um, and, and um, really trying to make these guidelines as independent as possible has been a hugely important part of this project. And another crucial part has been the involvement of patients and members of the public. Uh, and this is, again is a, is, a, is a thing that the BMJ has been working on over, over a number of years. And it's been a real delight to see that the MAGIC um, uh, BMJ collaboration has really put that at the forefront of, of the way these guidelines have been presented. Uh, a third achievement I think is the, is the format. I've mentioned the infographics. We know that they're incredibly popular. Um, they, they, they are very uh, you know, usable on, on social media. Uh, we've had them reprinted in a number of different forms. They, they really are a, a hugely helpful thing about get, getting the information through to people who need to see it and just making it feel, feel much more accessible. Uh, what the BMJ I think has brought as an achievement is the reach that we've been able to, 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 to bring to this. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that we, we bring as publishers is dissemination, international dissemination and international audience. We've made the, the guidance free um, which we're delighted to do. I mean, it's a tricky for us because obviously we have to um, bring in revenue for the journal as well, but it seemed to us that this was important, especially through COVID. Um, and, and they have reached a really, really wide readership and um, really, really wide audience, both in, in, in healthcare and in amongst the general public. Um, and we're also able to bring this, this, the fact that when you publish something, that's not the end of the game, often it's just the beginning. And, and so that post-publication debate, what do people think? Do they think this is right? What else do we need to do? Uh, and, and that's been a very interesting um, to have the, have the discussion ongoing. So those are the achievements I wanted to talk about around the guidance, around the research evidence, the, 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 the systematic reviews themselves. Obviously the huge achievement is the living systematic review. And this has been no small, um, no small enterprise. Uh, the benefits these bring, reducing research waste, reducing redundant publication, increase the rapid sharing, of information in rapidly um, developing research areas. And obviously at the time of the pandemic, this has been an immensely important thing to be able to do on the top of some fantastic research that's been done, for example, on, on the recovery platform and, and um, other, other big, big trial platforms. Um, with the partnership of WHO, who've been quite fantastic in, in working with MAGIC, with BMJ, um, and Bringing bringing the living guidance to to the to the COVID treatments has been a, a really a really impressive um, thing. So it's kind of rather like with Med Archive, our preprint server that we work with, with others on. Uh, living living guidance, living systematic reviews have absolutely hit their stride at the time when we most needed them. Um, I want to talk before moving on from those achievements, which I I, I think we should absolutely celebrate are some challenges which, which will help us to think about what, what the future holds. Um, for the living systematic reviews, um, we've, we've always wanted to bring the same rigorous processes to those as we would to any article that we publish, which means doing it at speed, dealing with, you know, li liaising with the authors, with peer reviewers, with statisticians, with technical editors, with the production team. Um, that, that's just a, a, a business as usual challenge, if you like. Um, but the specific challenge of adapting our publishing processes from the traditional ones of a single manuscript being an event which which stays the same in time and it, and 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 then you know it, it exists as, as it, and it has its own integrity to, to to a manuscript which can be updated making changes reposting and dealing with the the the, the, the um the citation trail making sure that that's all clear what's happened and when 
uh, that's been a challenge and and the team have done a brilliant job on on making that that possible um there's issues of capacity simply for us as a journal uh, we only publish 200 research articles a year the output from magic um and certainly through the covid pandemic has been really phenomenal but i'm very delighted to say that we have just launched sophie cook is with its editor-in-chief bmj medicine and new open access um multi-specialty journal which sits right um within the BMJ family. So the BMJ, BMJ Medicine and BMJ Open is the, is the large multi-journal, multi-specialty um, journal beneath that. So we, we have uh, now a really true cascade for the research that can be, can find a home. If, if the BMJ doesn't, don't feel it's right for the BMJ, uh, BMJ Medicine and then BMJ Open stand ready to, to take, you know, good systematic reviews and to work with the living systematic review process. So, so that's going to help uh, with capacity. Uh, clearly, a huge issue has been funding. Magic um, has done a great job of, of generating funding. It's obviously been a struggle, continues to be a struggle. We, we likewise, um, as I've said, have made the, the evidence. The evidence is free anyway because we're open access on that front, but we, we've waived open access fees and we've made the, the guidance free. These are all things which we do because we think it's the right thing to do, but it doesn't always help with our bottom line. So funding would, is an important issue that we all need to try to work, work on to, to, to help to make this initiative the new normal, which is what it should be. And then there's the academic rewards. You know, how do we, how do we truly reward those involved in, in the living systematic reviews and the guidance? Because it's huge amounts of work and they aren't standard, standard outputs in the usual way. And, and the academic rewards bodies are going to need time ways to, to, to um, genuinely reward the academic work that goes into this. Much of what I've described has been published in an editorial we put in the BMJ that Helen MacDonald, Elizabeth Loder and Cameron Abassi wrote in July 2020. Um, and that, that sort of sets out our, our, the process for living systematic reviews and, and what we hope for from the future. So moving on to the future, I mean, I think one of the great things about this initiative has been the collaboration, the teamwork, um, working across organizations, the, the general good faith and commitment to working transparently and um, really, really, really working together on this. So I, I very much hope and expect that that will continue and, and want to thank everyone who's been able to make that happen. Um, the learning, obviously, likewise, mutual learning, and not only for us, but, but for those who make use of the, of the, um, of the outputs and the innovation. Um, I've, I've been saying for a long time, but it hasn't happened in my lifetime as an editor, that, that, that research shouldn't really be in journals at all. It should be on open access databases, um, and um, it, we're moving in that way. But it's happening very slowly. People are very wedded still to the publication process, the the academic uh, reward, you know, um, uh, accountability, and the academic um, reward that comes from public publishing in a, in a peer reviewed journal. But I I think the future of of guidelines and the Magic App already set things out in a way that that one can see the way forward is, is for research to be published in a timely fashion and transparent fashion on open access databases. Uh, and then perhaps rather like the physics community does, um, publishing in peer reviewed journals as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a next step. So dissemination and then, and then um, evaluation, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's where, where I would see the future. Um, and I think really we're keeping at, at, a, at, at heart the, the aims of all of this, which, which continue to be um, improving patient care, improving shared decision making, and improving the quality of research, um, it's transparency and relevance and rigor of research. So I think this is a fantastic initiative, proud to be part of it, and, and many, many thanks for involving us, and um, best of luck for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and for being available on such a busy day. And, uh, and thank you uh, for this huge collaboration, uh, really, like you said, co-creation with uh, all members of your team. And uh, I really very much liked when you said this becoming the new normal, how can we invite others to do similar work? I wonder if there is a, one question in the audience, because since, since you're leaving, I want to give someone a chance. Is there a question for Fiona? I wonder, I mean, I just see Kat, Kat is there, who's, 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 who's yeah. holding the baby. Kat's holding the baby for Rapid Rex at the moment. Do you want to say something, Kat? Yes. Uh, no, no, thanks, Fee. I'd rather give someone the opportunity to, to question you, but thank you for the invitation. Is there any question in the audience? No. 
If not, I'd like to thank you again very much, Fiona Godley, and, um, and hope to talk soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So we'll move to the next.